Today we are on message number four of a city of refuge, a message we've been teaching here now. And today's title is Build and Sustain. Build and Sustain. And seeing how far we get, this may be the very last of, the, uh, of this series. Uh, if you haven't been here for any of them, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a review. It'll be a little rapid fire, but I, I encourage you to get a hold of the recordings or online. You can go online at our, on our church website and get it. This is an amazing historic event that has huge allegorical application to us today here in Miwok Village in California, United States, in the Church of Jesus Christ of 2019. And we read out of these, I'll, I'll kind of rapid fire through some of these scriptures in Numbers 35, verses 9 through 25. The Lord said to Moses, it's God's idea. The Lord said to Moses, go tell the children of Israel. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Verse 11, we want, I want you guys, God said it, you guys designate cities of refuge, which people can flee f- to if they have killed somebody accidentally. Verse 12, these cities shall be places of protection. That's the purpose for the city of refuge, to protect Protect the innocent. Verse 25, the community, who? The community must protect the people. Wait a minute, I, I thought this was God's idea. It is God's idea. But he has delegated to us to protect, to build, to sustain. Next slide, Joshua 20, verses 1 through 4. Again, just an excerpt that says, The elders at the gate, they must allow this slayer, this person who slayed some, killed somebody unintentionally, a slayer deemed innocent. They must allow him to enter the city, and they must give him a place among them. There's an elder. There are elders. There's local government. There's leadership. And they're given authority. They, they have the authority to allow or disallow. And life and death are involved. And they must, they don't only have the authority, but they have authority over resources. They have to provide a place for these that come. Deuteronomy 19.3, God says, build roads to the towns. God says to build the roads. Who's he telling to build the roads? Us, people. Now, I don't know how it strikes you, but we're talking about the God who is so sovereignly powerful that he all he had to do was speak the word and matter appeared. And stars began to roll into place and planets and moons and comets and galaxies. He spoke the word, be, and they were. And now he's telling us to build roads. Why doesn't he just road and have it just show up? He's saying, build these cities. Why didn't he just say, walls, be? The reason is because it's God's design to partner with his creation, with his sons and his daughters, He has given us dominion, and he has made us joint heirs with him and heirs of the kingdom of God. He wants us to do it. It's his idea, his design, his direction, his provision. But we're his hands extended. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier if he just said, city, road. Be a lot less hassle dealing than dealing with us. But he plans to rule and reign with a people. We're in training. This isn't the only place he does this. All through the Bible we see these examples of God partnering, delegating to his sons and daughters. 
When Moses was building or was told to build the tabernacle, it's not on your overhead, Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. Again, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel. God, through his leader, to the people. It's not the people telling the leader what God should do. It's not a church with a board that runs the pastor. It's the Lord speaking through his leaders to the people. And he says, he says, have the people bring me an offering. Wait a minute. God is the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Oh, and the hills, and the gold under the hills. Why does he need my stuff? He doesn't. He's training us. It's teaching us how to rule and reign. He's partnering with us. And then he says, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. I do think God likes it when we have some skin in the game. When we have a little buy-in. I think God likes his people to have a little ownership in it. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you on the mount. We don't, he gives us the plans we built. Aren't you glad it wasn't a democracy? Or a church building committee? Again, back to the city of refuge. It's God's idea... It's God's design and provision. But it's our responsibility to build, to manage, to sustain the city of refuge. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, help us put this together. Help us to see what you're saying. Help us to know what to do so that we can be and do what you call us to do. And we can accomplish your purposes here on this earth to see a people conform to the image of your Son, to see a people ready to rule and reign on, Christ, on earth as Christ and as, as He comes to rule and reign here. Father, in Jesus' name, anoint me. Anoint these lips, Lord, and this mouth so I can say what you want said. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, a little more, a little more review here. It's a city. A city is defined as a place that is protectable. It's got a watch. It's got a, somebody on guard. And it's a city of refuge. Your refuge is a sanctuary, a shelter. It's an asylum. It's, a, it's a, a place where people can find safety. The city of refuge, it was a historic event with current allegorical application. It was, it was God's plan to bring to bring a place of safety so that innocent people weren't killed. The law stated that when somebody was killed, the next of kin, they would call the avenger of blood, the next of kin was obligated by the law to go and kill the person who killed their dad or their brother or their wife. That was their obligation. But if it was an accidental death, that's why God set up these six cities relatively equidistant in Canaan where people could flee to find protection and safety. The community had to build it. They had to designate it, build the walls, reinforce the walls, build the gates, reinforce the gates, build the houses for protection, build the roads, build the on-ramps. They had to do it. They brought the guys in. They tried them. They, it wasn't some tax and then we'll hire somebody to do it. No, it was their responsibility to hear the case and judge. If the people were innocent, they let them stay in the city and they stayed there until the death of the high priest who was appointed for life. So it could be six months or 60 years. So once again, what is this 35-year-old 
idea have to apply with us? Allegory. It is representative of things. The city of refuge is representative of Jesus, the ultimate giver of mercy. And not just Jesus the head, but Jesus the body, us. We build the city of refuge. The avenger of blood was Satan. It represents Satan, the, the accuser of the brethren, who is bent on making sure you suffer for all the mistakes you ever made. The slayer deemed innocent, that's us. That's all who will come and all who will believe. Those who repent and come to the city of refuge. We're not only the slayer deemed innocent, but we're also the citizens. We're not only the refuge, we're the sanctuary. We're not only the practicers of repentance, but we're also dispensers of mercy, of love, of protection. The city of refuge, it's a sanctuary, a place for second chances. Anybody here ever get a second chance? How about a third chance? How about a fifth chance? Yeah? His mercies are new every morning. Aren't you glad? This is not a place. The City of Refuge Church is not a place where people are free to sin. This is not a place where people are free from the consequences of sin. But it is a place we are free from sin. A place where we are free to be vulnerable. A place where we can come and we can confess and we can forsake. A place where we can receive mercy that we don't deserve, grace that we don't deserve, life that we don't deserve. A place where we can learn to live free from sin. And repentance, of course, is the first and crucial component. Because if we don't leave our stuff at the door, we don't get to come in the door. Or if we come in the door, not leaving our stuff at the door, they will show us the door. We talked several weeks ago about structures and access. Walls, gates, and houses. These are the structures for protection, for shelter. The walls represent what? Salvation, right out of Isaiah 60, verse 18. The walls represent salvation. God's not asking us to build a wall around our church campus. God is challenging us to make His salvation our protection, to make Him our defense and our refuge. We must always remember to surround ourselves with his salvation and not our own efforts. We must never be ashamed of the gospel. The gates, what do the gates represent? Praise, worship. Next to the gospel, worship has been the foundation of this church. We must never lose. We must never diminish our commitment to hosting the presence of God, being guardians of the oil, the anointing. Houses, we're not, we're not talking about stick frame construction, two by fours, two by sixes. We're talking about connecting with folks as they come in. We're talking about opening our hearts to them, providing covering, providing shelter for their souls. Will you be covering and shelter for the souls of those that come in these doors? Roads and on-ramps. This is all done for ease of access to the sea. What good is there to have a city up on the mountain if nobody can get to it? The roads talk about a wide place, a wide way leading from one place to another. It's a course of life, a mode of action. Yes, we're the city of refuge. We're the slayers deemed innocent. We are the the, the citizens, but we are also the main way people come to know about a city of refuge. We are. It's not 
newspaper articles. It's not Facebook and websites. It's you and me at the grocery store. It's you and me at work. It's you and me at the gym. It's you and it's our life. It's our lifestyle. And it's, it's what they see more than what they hear. Because you know what we do shout so loud, nobody can hear what we're saying. So what are we shouting? Are we shouting Jesus? Are we shouting mercy? Are we shouting love? Are we shouting truth? Or are we putting obstacles in the way? Are we making stumbling blocks with our lifestyle? If we see the road as us and see us in the road as the way people get here, we're going to be a little more dedicated to the life we live. On-ramps. These are what are used to get us out of our neighborhood, onto the highway, to get us from the hood to the highway, right? On-ramps represent the individual ways and opportunities that we can use to connect folks in our neighborhood, connect folks in their neighborhood to the highway that leads to the city of refuge. That's you and me. Last week we came up with about a dozen of these things, some of which we're already doing, some of them we need to start doing. But we have to do it. We have to do it. We have to build, we have to sustain the city of refuge. God designs it. He desires it. He provides it. But we have to, we have to, we have to build it, sustain it, do it. Emphasis on we, we do. This shouldn't surprise us that we have to do it. Man was created to create. So why are we surprised when man creates something? We were built to build. We're made to make. We are given so we can... Who? We. <laughs> Stop teasing me. Yes, we all need to eat something during the day. We all burn some juice to heat the house or cool the, in the summer. We all consume some. But we need to create more than we consume. Last week I got cranking in the message, and I don't think I adequately emphasized, but I want to say it really clear. That's how we as humans are created. That we that is ultimately what satisfies us, is when we create more than we consume. Now, this is not politically correct. This is not the American way anymore. The American way is we're entitled, and somebody's going to give it to us because I deserve it. But that's not the scriptural way. And it's not the way we were created and it will not satisfy us. I think that alone is one of the main reasons there's so much dissatisfaction, dysfunction, despair, suicide, drug addiction in America because we're chasing the wrong thing thinking it will satisfy us. He alone will satisfy us. And when we start living the way we were created, that will satisfy us. We will not be satisfied until we start creating and producing more than we consume. Having doesn't satisfy. Possessing things, having things doesn't satisfy. Creating does. Taking doesn't satisfy. Giving does. Receiving Hey, I like Christmas as much as the next guy. I just had a birthday. and People gave me a lot of cool things. But you know, a week later, we still want more stuff. But when you are giving, when you're creating, there's a satisfaction in your soul that nothing else can satisfy and meet. 
So what's the secret to the existence of a city of refuge? What's the secret to sustaining the city of refuge? Creating, building, and giving. These are what make it happen. First, of course, as always, God initiates. God is the ultimate giver. First, God, and then us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He he gave. Romans 8.32, this isn't on your overhead either. Or is it? Hey! Hey, let's put it together for the overhead folks. Since He did not spare even His own Son, but He... He gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? Second Peter 1. I don't think that's up there, is it? Oh, nope. oh, no, Second Peter. Second Peter 1, verse 3 through 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it's simply that, that by his divine power, he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gave all to us. And our response is so that we can give all diligence to make our calling and election sure. There's that partnership again. He provides, He gives, and then He's waiting. He's waiting for our response. Most of the time, we're waiting for Him to give some more. But when we step up and respond and we give all diligence to make our calling and election sure, He pours out things that we could never imagine. This is not something we're earning, something He's giving we're responding to. This is not a message of works. This is a message of manifesting the grace and the life that He gave. He's the great giver. So giving, how do we give? I've been giving you some rhetorical questions, not expecting an answer. This one I'm expecting an answer. How do we give? With what? Through the community. Okay, we give through the community. How do we give through the community? How do we give? Joyfully, cheerfully, good. With our hearts. Number one. With our hearts. I was expecting someone to say, Tithes and offerings. That's good too. We'll talk about that maybe a little later. But tithes and offerings. Or the other one, time. But what's number one? Our hearts. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. That's the first and greatest commandments. If, if there's nothing else, that's what we have. When I first came to this church, I didn't have much else. I didn't have money. I had heart and I had time. And I gave my heart. And then I gave my time. And I gave whatever money I had, which wasn't much. What if you're paraplegic and on life supports? What do you have to give? That's right. We start with our heart. We give with our hearts. And then we give with our time. And then we give with our tithes and offerings. Let's talk about tithes and offerings. Is tithing an obligation? <laughs> Not very decisive. <laughs> Is tithing an obligation? Really? Air I need. If I don't breathe for three or four minutes, I will die. If I don't tithe, yeah, don't do that. Okay, I promise. <gasps> Wee! Yeah, okay. No air, I die. If I don't tithe, I'm not going to die. Not right away. <laughs> Amen. Water, food, 
Those I need. I don't do them, I'm going to die. If I don't tithe, I'm not going to die. So I don't see tithing as an obligation. I know that may be strange to everybody. What's the pastor talking about saying the tithing is not an obligation? Should we tithe? It all depends on what you want. Do you want to live constantly under a curse? Or do you want to live under an open heaven with the windows of heaven open and the blessings poured out beyond what you can receive? What, what do you want? That determines whether you should tithe. Now, I want to discuss something here. Some people think, and I was among them, some people think that the Bible teaches that if you don't give a tithe and offering, that God curses you. I used to believe that. The answer is no. But wait a minute, the word curse is right there. Let's, let's read it. Malachi, it's not, it's not up there. I don't think, unless they're ahead of me. Malachi 3, chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Listen to this. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. One of the primary scriptures that talks about tithes and offerings and uses that C word, curse. This is God speaking to His children. This is after they were captured and taken by Nebuchadnezzar, spent 70 years in captivity. They've come back. And they are now in this, in the, back in Jerusalem, building the temple, building the city. 400 years later, Jesus will show up. Okay, you got the timeline? God is speaking to his people. He says, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees, and you have failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. That means he's got some juice behind him. What he says will happen, right? But you ask, how can we return when we never even have gone away? God's response is, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? We didn't, we didn't never, we never cheated you. You have cheated me in the tithes and the offerings due to me. You are under a curse. I don't hear him say, I curse you, or God curses you, or even that you're under God's curse. The King James says you are cursed with a curse. Again, no reference to God's curse. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring me all the tithes into the storehouse. What does the word tithe mean? A tenth. Give it to me in percentages. Ten percent. So when he says all the tithe, that means not three percent. Not five percent. Not seven and a half percent. Ten percent. And bring the tithe into the storehouse, the, the treasury of the temple, the place where you serve, the place that serves you, so that there may be provision in my house. I don't see it saying, but Lord, there's a group of Levites over in Tel Aviv that have got a Bible school and they're really doing a great job and, and I got a burden for Bible schools and, and I'd like to support them. So I'm going to send them some money. Hey, that's great, man. Send them some money. But that's not the tithe. And that's not where you take the tithe. But Lord, there's, a, there's an orphanage over here in Jericho and these guys are doing a great job and man, they're broke, and they need my help. I have a burden for it. I'm going, to send, I'm going to send some money there. Fabulous. Please do that. But that's not the tithe. And that's not where the tithe goes. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse 
So there will be enough food in my temple if you do that. So who's got the choice here at this point? Yeah, he's placed it before us. The opportunity is now ours. It's in our lap. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room to take it in. Wait a minute, Lord, I got a lot of room. Anybody got a lot of room? A lot of room for God's blessings? It don't matter how much room you got for his blessings. He will pour out a blessing you can't contain. That's his promise, the promise of the Lord of the angel armies. I'll open the windows of heaven. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't even have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. This is the only place I've found in Scripture where God says, test me. Everywhere else says, you better not test me. But this one says, come on. Give me a shot. Let me prove it to you. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from the insects and disease. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, it says in the King James. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight. Okay, let's get back to this, the C word, curse. Where does it say that God cursed anybody? The only curse I know is the one we brought on ourselves when Adam broke the law of God, of life, of living. If you haven't noticed, the kingdom of God hasn't completely been set up here on earth. Every knee isn't bowing. Every tongue isn't confessing to Jesus Christ as Lord. I'm excited to know that Christianity is the fastest growing faith on the planet in spite of what America is or isn't doing. I'm excited to know that more people by the tens of thousands are bowing their knee, confessing with their mouth. But not all knees are bowed. Not all tongues are confessing. Do I hear an amen? amen. Yes, the power of God is ours today. Do, I, do you believe that? Yes. yes, Satan and his forces have had their power and their authority legally revoked and given to us. But the eviction process is not done yet. He has no longer any legal right to occupy this earth. We are the ones to kick him out, but we still got some work to do. He still is a formidable foe, a powerful foe. We still need to put on all of God's armor to stand against him in his assaults. We still have to be aware, alert, and knowledgeable of his devices and schemes. He has not rolled over and thrown up the white towel. People are still getting sick. I'm seeing healings. We're excited about God's moving, but people are still getting sick. Cancer is still stealing and robbing our loved ones. Pestilence, wars, earthquakes, these things are still happening because Jesus hasn't come back to claim his kingdom and set up his kingdom on the earth. He's still not sitting on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem today. He's still at the right hand of the father. The kingdom is still to be fulfilled in the fullest dimension. Therefore, it's not God that curses us if we don't tithe. We already live in a land that's cursed. We already live on a cursed planet. Am I the only one that sees this? The difference is that we don't have to. We, those who are saved, those who are born again, those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't have to live under that curse. But what is God asking us to do so he can provide and protect us from this curse? Give. First from the? 
then from our time, and then our tithes and offerings. That's only 10%, remember? Let me give you an illustration. See if it works. <laughs> it used to. The curse is like a torrential rainstorm. It's already raining. It's been raining for thousands of years. We're already drenched to the underwear. Do I have an amen? amen. <laughs> but when we tithe, when we give of our time, most importantly, when we give of our hearts, it's like God gave us an umbrella. And though we're walking around in this torrential rainstorm, we're protected from the rain. We're protected from all the stuff that everybody else has to deal with. He will rebuke the devourer on our behalf. He will open the windows of heaven. Oh, well, that's another illustration I, I was going to do. But I, Selena has this really long extension thing, and I was going to tie tape, duct tape a hook to it and try to reach up to these windows. God's given us a tool to, to open the windows of heaven. But I realized the tool is a lot simpler than that. It's more like an electronic garage door opener. All, all we got to do is, well, it's not going to open. You know it's not going to open. Joe, Joe Jones wish it would open, right? But all, all we got to do is click. All we got to do is what? Give. First what? Our hearts. Number two, our time. Our, and number three, our, our tithes and our offerings. Do we, are we getting this? So I ask you again, is tithing an obligation? I call it an opportunity. An opportunity to get dried out. An opportunity so your underwear can dry out. Tired of walking around in soggy underwear? Are you tired of that? Are you ready to get out of the rain? Then guess what? The ball's in our court. Oh, God, help me from the rain. Hey, knothead, start giving. All I got to do is give. All I got to do is give. You know, there's a lot of people here in this room. In fact, I'm here to tell you categorically, the vast majority of the people in this room are amazing givers. Amazing people that give of their heart, that give of their time, that give of everything they have, including their tithes and their offerings. These people are the reason why this is a city of refuge. There are a whole bunch of people worldwide that give. We heard some amazing stories at the, affecting destiny. The, the people of Fiji, we heard from the man who has the church of 50 or 60,000, Pastor Sule, what accomplished there in Fiji. Amazing stuff. People in this world know how to give. They know how to get underneath their umbrella. There's a whole bunch of people right here. The vast majority of you are givers. So today, this is not a pitch. This is not a pitch for money for you today. Today, this is, a, 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 this is an expression from my heart to you. Thank you. This is an attaboy. This is a pat on the back to all those people who have, who have given and given so faithfully year after year. That's the reason we have a city of refuge. That's the reason we've been one and we are one. That's the reason why we have a sanctuary, why we have a fellowship hall, why we have a junior church, a chapel, a life house, a lodge. Debt free. Debt free. And it's not because checks showed up in the mail. This is not, I'm not going to, I'm not one of those preachers. I'm not going to say, man, you sell your car and give me the money and you'll be seeing a check in the mail on Tuesday, Monday morning. That never happened to me. What God did is he gave me a job. God gave me a job. Oh, but the problem was I didn't know how to work. I was a lazy bum. 
I was a lazy kid. I did not have any work skills. I did not know how to work. He gave me a job. Then he showed me how to work. He began to skill me, began to give me wisdom, began to give me understanding. I became a profitable employee. And guess what bosses do to profitable employees? They give them a raise. They give them a promotion. Who knew? I was a loser. I became a winner because he poured out the windows of heaven. He gave. Now in context to this message of the city of refuge, the city of refuge thing doesn't happen unless we give. It doesn't, it isn't built unless we give. It isn't sustained, it isn't managed unless we give. Now I'm not saying that we will be a city of refuge if you give. I'm here to tell you we are a city of refuge because you gave. Now the question is, what do you guys want to do going forward? We just put 50 years behind us. What do you want to do for the next however many? Where do you want to go? We are a city of refuge. We are a resource center. We are going to continue to be a city of refuge and a resource center. But where do you want to go with it? How big is your vision? Because it's not a matter of whether it's going to be that. It's a matter of how big it's going to be. It's not a matter of whether we're going to reach people. It's how many people do you want to reach. When, when we first met Tony Miller, the first word of prophecy, he said to Celine and I, it's bigger than you think. I'm going, are you kidding? It's already too big. Of this. That's not good news, Bishop. We put Bob Wilk on staff, one of the great men of God, and it was one of the best decisions we ever made. And shortly thereafter, he comes up to me and he says, Pat, Celine, we're not thinking big enough. This is supposed to be bigger than what we're, we're doing here. Speaking specifically about the minister's training program. And then they revamped it into spirit and spirit training. It's not, it's, it's, we're not thinking big enough. One of the first things Liz Jones did when she came on board, worked for a few months, we had a staff meeting. I don't mean to be insulting Pastor Pat, Pastor Salim, Pastor Bob, but you guys aren't thinking big enough. How big do you want this to go? It's going to be based on how much we give. Again, I'm not pitching money. I know that at most churches, this is the point when the elders gather and we bring out the plates and we start passing plates. I'm not going to do that. I've never done that. I don't intend ever to do that. I don't ever intend to do that. I'm not here, I'm not here to, to try to drive you to impulse action. I'm not here to try to, to get you whipped up emotionally and pass the plate. No, no, we took an offering. We're going to fellowship here and we're, and we're done. I'm not looking for impulse action. I'm looking for lifestyle. I'm looking for kingdom lifestyle that will create, build, and sustain a city of refuge like the world's never known and bless us in the process. Get us out of the rain. But where do we want to go? Again, for most of us, this is a confirmation of an existing lifestyle. When I say most of us, I'm talking 70-80%. Unfortunately, whenever I teach on tithing, the people who are already tithing feel guilty. And they come up, am I not giving enough? I rebuke that spirit of condemnation in the name of Jesus, and I'm being dead serious. You guys are what has made this church a success. God bless you. Thank you. For you, this is an attaboy. For a few, this is a reminder of how it works. This is a hint as to why your underwear are wet. <laughs> this is an encouragement for you to take the umbrella. And for a few of you, this is a whole new idea. The light's going on. Oh my gosh, I don't have to live in the slum anymore. I can live 
in the city of refuge. I don't have to live in a spirit of poverty for the rest of my life. I can be a success. I can go from loser to winner. And it's real simple. It's not what you take. It's not waiting at the mailbox for a check. Are you willing to give? And give first, then your time, and then your money. If we do that, this place will never cease to be the city of refuge. And if we do it with what God's called us to, with what's in our heart, this Miwok notoriety is going to continue to grow until everybody in the world is going to know who and where Miwok is. Anybody want to build a city of refuge? Let's all stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We don't deserve it. Nothing we have done has earned us the right to be a part of what you're doing. But in your amazing love and mercy, Lord, you drew us out of some of the most crazy perspectives and crazy situations, and you brought us to your house, you brought us to yourself, you brought us to your love. Lord, today we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be a part of something amazing, of what you're doing on this earth and how you've caused us to be a part of it. Father, in the name of Jesus today, Lord, open our understanding. Cause us to see you never did curse us. You came to take the curse off of us. You came to be a curse so we could be free from the curse. You came to deliver us, Father. Lord, thank you for all that you have done. Help us. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Help us to think bigger. Help us to do, to manage, to sustain, to build the city of refuge. And you'll get all the credit. You get all the honor. You get all the glory. We pray this. We ask this. We thank you in advance for this in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.